Thank you. I, I think you have a receptive audience here. Uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Tom, and, uh, and thank you to, uh, to 92 NY. Such a great institution, and it's an honor to be here uh, with you, with you, Liz Cheney. Well, thank you. Great to be with you. And, and your book, we have just learned uh, yet another week as number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So congratulations. So uh, a lot to get to regarding the book. This is also like a, a, a pretty monumental news day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot yeah. has happened in the yeah. world uh, today, this week. Just yesterday, we had a former president of the United States uh, who's currently running for president again in court, arguing that presidents enjoy absolute immunity for anything they do uh, as president. Interesting argument, um, which we will get to. And then just <laughs> before we came on the stage, we, we received news that Chris Christie has dropped out of the Republican uh, presidential yeah. race. Yeah. Um, and I want to start there because in his announcement in New Hampshire that he was dropping out, he said something that um, sounded a lot like I think, I've, I've heard from you, he said, anyone unwilling to say he is unfit, meaning Trump, anyone unwilling to say that Trump is unfit to be president is unfit to be president. Well, now there are two candidates standing. Yeah. And both have said that they would support him even if he is convicted of a felony. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's wonderful to be back again uh, at the 92nd Street Y and, and wonderful to be here in conversation with you, John, and... and the work that you've done on all of these issues has been hugely important, and uh, your, uh, all of your books, but uh, in particular, uh, Betrayal and Tired of Winning, the last two, I highly recommend everybody for understanding sort of what it really meant um, to cover Donald Trump and the kind of person he is, and, and uh, an inside uh, look at all of these details and issues. Um, the, uh, it, it's a fundamental, um, I think probably uh, potentially unrecoverable problem for the Republican Party um, that uh, we've had so many candidates and so many leaders reflexively uh, say they will support Donald Trump if he's the nominee. And, you know, it's a, some of the people who do that are clearly operating in the way that Republicans and Democrats have always operated. It's sort of like the party loyalty is you're going to support the nominee of your party. Um, obviously, when you know the potential is that the nominee of the party um, is going to be somebody who attempted to seize power um, and uh, overturn an election, uh, do all of the things that we know Donald Trump did, uh, it, it's not an acceptable answer to the question. So I'm I'm. Sorry to see that Chris Christie is out of the race. Uh, I think it's important for all of us, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, to commit ourselves to speaking the truth and to demanding that of our elected officials as well. What does it say now with Christie gone that there is, I mean, Asa Hutchinson's still running, but, um, but you know, that, that there's, there's no other major candidate left that is really willing to take him head on. As another thing he said today is they are not campaigning to win, not campaigning to defeat Donald Trump. They're campaigning not to offend him. Um, that was the way Chris Christie was defining it. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I think this is something that we've seen certainly from the party uh, over the last three years. And um, there are a whole bunch of explanations for it. There are probably different motivations for different people and why they're doing it. But um, if, you, if you think about sort of who really believes what Donald Trump is saying uh, among elected Republicans, it's an extremely small number. Uh, there are far more who know what he's saying is a lie, who know the danger that he poses, but who've decided that they're willing to look the other way um, in order not to offend him uh, in order to maintain their own, you know, political positions. And, and we've seen this in other places around the world. You know, Donald Trump's tactics are authoritarian. And we know that authoritarians can't succeed alone. They have to have enablers. They have to have collaborators. And history will judge those people. But, but that's what's happening. It's, a, it's, you know, people who are willing to collaborate with the person who's you know, launched an assault on the foundations of the country. Uh, 
Well, I, I want to get to how we got to that point. And I think your book, uh, which is, is a very valuable piece of history, because you document your role uh, throughout this incredibly consequential time, and you document it with reference to your real-time notes, text messages, emails, and, and you were the Republican conference chair. You were a Republican leader, but not just a Republican leader in Congress. You were the Republican leader in charge of convening, convening all the House Republicans. So you have a particular vantage point. So I want to find out how we got to, to that point. But yesterday, there was a moment in court, which I don't know if we could ever have imagined before, where you had, first of all, a former president sitting there as an observer, but his lawyer arguing that he cannot be prosecuted for a crime, for anything remotely tied to his duties as president, unless he is first impeached and convicted in a Senate trial. What, 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 did, you, what did you think particularly of the, of the example that was given, yeah. if he had called a, a SEAL Team 6 strike to assassinate a political opponent? Right. And the lawyer said, no, he couldn't be prosecuted unless he was first impeached and convicted in the yeah. Congress? Well, I thought that it was a very important and effective question um, to highlight the, the impact of the position that Trump has taken. And, and I, you know, I think if, if you imagine a situation where a president does such a thing and then immediately resigns, and you know, having resigned, uh, there are many people who would then argue, well, he's not in office, so he can no longer be impeached and convicted. And so you end up, you know, and we saw this argument with respect to the January 6th impeachment uh, where, um, you know, there are many senators who said, well, what Donald Trump did is terrible and, and you know, may warrant conviction, but I'm not going to vote to convict because he's already out of office and, and there's no constitutional authority. I think that's the wrong reading of the Constitution, but it's a completely unsustainable and, and I, you know, I think lacking in any basis in the law or the Constitution. And, and I think it's, a, it's yet the most recent example uh, that requires all of us as citizens to commit that we won't become numb to that. And, and to make sure that we're you know, talking to uh, friends and family and spreading the word that, you know, yes, we, we hear every day more outrageous things from Donald Trump and more dangerous things from Donald Trump. We have to take him literally and we have to take him seriously. And we, these are the things that um, you know, tell us who he is in addition to the actions that, that he's already taken. And we, that's not who we are as a nation. I mean, the other thing about the absolute immunity argument, the way it was outlined yesterday, which is, again, unless a president is impeached and convicted, it means if there are 34 senators right. refusing to convict him in a Senate trial, they can do whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. No, I mean, look, it is, it is, uh, it's an unsustainable argument. Um, I'm, I'm confident that it won't prevail. Uh, but, but I think there, it's also important, in addition to sort of how dangerous that argument is, it's important to think about what Donald Trump's doing. You know, uh, he's doing everything he can to delay this trial. And it's not just sort of the actions of a defendant that you know you normally see. This is because he wants to suppress the evidence. Because he knows the people who will testify against him aren't his political opponents. They're the people who know him best. It's people like his White House counsel and you know the uh, leadership of the Justice Department and probably the vice president. Um, you know, these people who know Trump best, who were there with him um, on the day and in the days leading up to it, who told him his claims were false, um, who told him that what he wanted to do was illegal and unconstitutional, those are the people who will be on the witness stand in this trial. And Trump does not want the American people to see that evidence, to hear that evidence before they vote. It's a very important point because you, before the January 6th committee, brought forward, first of all, virtually everybody you called as a witness was a Republican. Yeah. There were a few that weren't, but almost all of them were Republicans. And they testified under oath a number of things, yep. including that, by the way, none of them saw any evidence of voter fraud yeah. uh, enough to change uh, the election. Um, but Jack Smith has been able to talk to people who refuse to exactly. talk to you. Dan Scavino, his right. former golf caddy, 
and manager of his Twitter account, which yeah. made him maybe the most powerful person in the West Wing. <laughs> Not maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, Scavino right. described Trump, and he was with him, because of course you have your Twitter guy with you while the Capitol is under attack. He was with him throughout the day on yeah. January 6th. Um, and he provides, the ABC News investigative team, we had a story out on this just this week. Yep. We, we know that he has, according to our sources, has testified to Trump's behavior during those hours that you had that incredibly dramatic hearing about. But now this is not Liz Cheney recounting it with, um, you know, with, with the people you were able to talk to. This is Dan Scavino, right. who still works for him, by yeah. the way. Yeah, I think it's, and, and what, what you all have reported that Scavino testified to confirms and corroborates what we had heard as well. Um, you know, one of the moments in the select committee hearings that I thought was, was crucially important was when we were questioning Pat Cipollone, and he was very careful about privilege. He didn't want to convey or, you know, talk to us about conversations he'd had with the president. But there was a moment when we asked, you know, who, uh, who in the West Wing did not want the mob to, to, to leave the Capitol? And, and it was clear, it was everybody. Everyone he wanted them everybody. to leave. Yes, everyone <laughs> wanted them to leave except Donald Trump, except yeah. one person. Well, you followed up so, with the follow-up question. It was a very, it was a very dramatic moment. Yeah, you said, no, including was, the president? He's like, was like, well, no. I, I, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, and I'm not answering no, but I just can't talk about what he said. But right. I mean, it was, it was. No, and it, the other thing. Um, extraordinarily, it's, it's extraordinary, by the way. These are all of the people there. And Scavino describes this. Scavino describes himself going into that dining room off the Oval Office, begging him right. uh, to do something to call off his own supporters. And he describes Trump as being fixated on the television watching literally yep. Fox News live coverage of the attack on the Capitol and um, being non-responsive to the people who, including Scavino and Mark Meadows and the lawyers who are begging him to do something. This is, this is the portrait you described. Right. But here you have somebody that is there and this is what you're saying Trump doesn't want to see on the stand. Right. The other point, and, and this is in the Select Committee report, but it hasn't gotten as much attention is um, you know, we had testimony that he was handed the note that said that there had been a civilian, a civilian shot at the door to the House chamber. Um, one of our witnesses testified that he saw the note sitting in front of Donald Trump on the dining room table. And even then, even then, he continued to refuse to tell people to go home. So the, the level of, of just depravity here um, really can't be can't be overstated, it's very significant. Nick Luna, who was his personal assistant, carried, you know, another one of these, you know, body guy, the yes, guy that carries yeah. the bags for the president, um, also testified to Jack Smith that um, he informed Trump that Mike Pence had been evacuated to a secure location. Yeah, yeah. And he says that the president's response to that were two, was two words, so what? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, your interviews with Trump include uh, audio uh, of Donald Trump suggesting, you know, when you asked him if he was concerned about the hang Mike Pence chance, uh, he said, well, it just was common sense. So I, I, this all goes to, you know, what this trial will be, what the American people will see, and why Donald Trump is so desperate to, to prevent that as long as he can. Do you think he'll be able to delay long enough that it effectively pushes it past the election? Uh, I, I certainly hope not. I think that um, we've seen the courts be, you know, seized with the urgency of the matter. And, and look, it, it, it just can't be the case that in the American system of justice, a president can do what he did and not face accountability not be tried for those actions until after the next election. I mean, that, that's not a functioning judicial system. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that, uh, that he won't be able to continue to suppress this evidence as long as he, he hopes he will. Okay, I wanna get into the book. There was one thing that really struck me as I was reading it, um, and that is you talk quite a bit, particularly in the first part of, of the book, talking about the uh, the, the, the period right after the election of 2020. 
And you talk about an obscure Republican congressman from Louisiana. I think his name was Mike Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's, it's important to point out that when you wrote this, he was an obscure congressman from Louisiana. Right. And by the time it was published, he was the Speaker of the House. Yeah, yeah. But tell, t talk yeah. a little bit about the well, significance of Mike Johnson and why you spent so much yeah. time talking about him. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time recounting in detail, as, as you point out, the role that he played both in urging Republicans to sign on to this very damaging amicus brief um, and also in objecting to the electoral votes. And, and I spent so much time on it because I really think it, you know, the, the example of, of Mike Johnson, he's somebody who uh, was a friend of mine, somebody who seems to be uh, committed to operating in good faith. And then as we got into this period of time, it was clear that I'd been completely wrong in my assessment of him and that he was willing to do things that he knew to be wrong uh, in order to try to convince the Republican colleagues, for example, uh, to sign on to a brief that was full of assertions and allegations that uh, about fraud uh, uh, across a number of states that had already been rejected by lower courts, um, that he would misrepresent what the brief was. But, but I think perhaps most concerning and most uh, you know, urgently and immediately relevant is you know, Johnson explained that his view was that he could determine, um, because he felt, uh, because he was convinced that, that certain states had violated the Constitution, that he could then decide he was gonna throw out the votes of the citizens of those states. And this is so dangerous because, of course, in each of those states, um, courts had heard and rejected those claims. Uh, the process by which the votes are certified had been followed. The governors of the states had certified those votes and sent them to Washington. And there is no basis in the Constitution for the House of Representatives to simply determine because they have a feeling that the Constitution's violated and therefore install the person they want as president. And, and that's exactly what what Johnson's position was and, and frankly continues to be. And I think it's, it's why it's so important for people to recognize the danger that we could face if Mike Johnson and the Republicans are in the majority on the next January 6th. The, 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 the amicus brief that, that you wrote about and that he <clears throat> was trying to get everybody to sign, there are a couple of very important points about this. One is, as it was sent around to your Republican colleagues in the House, it was sent around with an implicit threat. Right. It yeah. was, I'm going to share the list of names who sign on with the president. He is very eager to see them by the end of the day today. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it was particularly, I mean, the lawsuit's pretty incredible because it was the, it was the state of Texas asking the Supreme Court to throw out the electoral votes from five other states that right. Biden had won. Yeah, and it-, it I mean, think about that. I uh, mean, no, it was, it, it, and and uh, in, in the case of each of those states, the brief itself made these assertions about yeah. fraud that simply weren't true. And, you know, I, I took about, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes to read the brief. I was alerted to the brief by other members who said, you know, Johnson just sent this thing around and he's threatening people. Um, you know, is this a leadership initiative? Um, and then I took 20 or 30 minutes to read it and then got in touch with him. And I said, you know, look, this makes assertions about facts that are not true, that have been dispensed, of with, dispensed with by lower courts. And I also said to him, I thought it raised serious ethical issues for anybody who was a member of the bar to sign this brief, you're submitting this to the court, claiming that you have knowledge of these facts um, about which you don't and, and which aren't true. So uh, Johnson was on television on Sunday and he said that you initially were considering signing that brief. Yeah. Now I know you pretty well and I, I heard him say that. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, you were not considering no. signing that brief. No. Uh, yeah, I, I, look, <laughs> a, a lot of things, surprise me 
I mean, that, that one was that pretty, was That's pretty, I mean, that would that surprise was, me. Yeah. So, no, I mean, yeah. look, it, uh, and again, uh, you know, this was, it was very clear that what he was doing was, was wrong and, yeah. and was unconstitutional. And I had actually not just been mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. touch with him, but Kevin McCarthy's own lawyer um, had expressed the same concerns and had written analyses of this, this brief that made clear that, you know, what Johnson was attempting to do was breathtaking and certainly not something that, that should be supported. In fact, you had your own memo a short while after that that I think was a very important document. I told you at the time, I wrote about it in Betrayal. Um, you wrote a memo to the entire Republican uh, House membership um, warning about the dangers of objecting on January 6th. I think yeah. it was dated January 3rd, 3rd or 2nd. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, it went through case by case. But, but, but the, the, the big picture thing is, it, as you were, it's not up for Congress right, right. <laughs> to usurp the right of the states uh, uh, to, to certify their own, their own electoral votes. Yeah, it was, it, I felt it was necessary because we were getting questions from Republican members about two big things. One was, what's really happening in the courts? Because, of course, you had the Trump campaign making these claims. And so I thought it was important to walk through the major decisions and frankly also to point out that in, in a number of these cases where the courts had rejected the claims, the judges had been appointed by Donald Trump. So this wasn't a situation where you know this was a, a partisan review by any means. But I also thought it was important to explain to people what our constitutional responsibility was. Um, and, and look, I, I again, I think what's happened now, sadly, is because the majority of Republicans objected in 2020, 2021, that has become a precedent now. And you're already seeing Johnson, Stefanik, others saying, well, you know, we're going to have to see, as, as Stefanik said, we'll have to see whether or not the election is legal and valid. And, and it, that's, that's tyranny if Congress decides we are only going to count the votes um, to certify an election if you know the person that we wanted wins that election. Okay, so your memo didn't um, convince the majority of your colleagues, uh, and the majority did in fact go through and voted to object. But I wanna ask you, because you write about it quite vividly in, in this book, the, the objection started before the attack on the Capitol, before they actually came into the building, I should say. Yeah. Uh, then the Capitol is evacuated. Congress has to go out of session. Um, dramatic scene, we all know. You come back in session at eight o'clock the evening of January 6th. And then you, in the interim, you're, you're, you're going to your colleagues who had objected and you're saying, look, you may have disagreed with me before the attack on the Capitol, you can't disagree with me now. Right. I mean, for the sake of the country, yeah. we have to be unified now. And yet, they all voted again, including Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, and, and that was one of the most... To, 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 to throw out electoral votes. Right. And, and there, so uh, when we were evacuated, I was on the phone with Kevin. We were still in the Ways and Means room. And he told me, I said, all right, we got to get back into session. He said, yeah, that's the plan. He said, I'm going to make a speech uh, I think he, he said, I'm going to make a speech about America and unity, um, and, and we're not going to continue to object. So I hung up with him, and I went out into the larger room again, and I told his general counsel, listen, I just talked to Kevin. We're going back into session. We're not going to continue objecting. And she said to me, hmm, she said, you know, Jim Jordan just told me that he just talked to Kevin, and Kevin said, we are going to continue objecting. Wow. And, and I, you know, my, I thought, well, Jim Jordan's lying. Like, yeah. you know, it wouldn't be the first time. So, um, <laughs> but as it turned out, um, Kevin had been lying and uh, continued. You know, I was sitting on the floor of the house listening to him speak. And this is, you know, the Capitol, is, the glass is still shattered. The, the you know, the, the Capitol had been under attack, um, had just been cleared. And certainly, certainly that's the moment for leadership and the moment to say, we're gonna to come together as a nation, we're doing our duty. Joe Biden has been elected president, we're gonna count those votes, but, but that's not the decision that, that Kevin made. So I wanna ask you about a decision you made six days later, 
which was to you put out a statement saying that you would vote to impeach Donald Trump. And I've said this to you before, I think this statement became the thesis statement for basically all the work of the January 6th committee beyond. Uh, so I wanna read, and it's not a long statement, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read the, uh, you say on January 6, 2021, a violent mob attacked the United States Capitol to obstruct the process of our democracy and stop the counting of presidential electoral votes. This insurrection caused injury, death, and destruction in the most sacred space in our republic. Much more will become clear in the coming days and weeks, but what we know now is enough. The President of the United States summoned this mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Everything that followed was his doing. None of this would have happened without the President. The President could have immediately and forcefully intervened to stop the violence he did not there has never been a greater betrayal by a president of the United States of his office and his oath to the Constitution. So, how, I, I, how did you have that clarity at that moment when so many others did not? I mean, that. And you said in that statement, we will learn much more in the coming days, and we did learn much more, yeah. but none of it deviated from what you wrote in that, in that statement on January 12th. Yeah, um, you know, I, um, I knew, and, and I remember as I was, you know, being evacuated with my colleagues down the steps, out of the House chamber, into the tunnels under the Capitol while the mob was attempting to get into the chamber, at that moment, I knew Donald Trump must be impeached and he must be removed from office. He was obviously then still in office and I viewed him as a, a clear and present danger to the nation. So my view was immediately then, there was no question. Um, and the truth of the matter is if you go back and you look at what you know my colleagues were saying both privately and publicly, uh, I was not the only one who believed that. And, and interestingly, uh, if you look at the, there was a resolution drafted by a number of House Republicans on January 10th to censure Donald Trump. And the language of that resolution is almost identical to the language of the article of impeachment in terms of laying out what Donald Trump did. So there was widespread agreement that he was, account he was responsible, um, that uh, it had been a violation of his, his duty and you know, you had some members arguing, well, if we impeach him, it will just simply further the division in the country. People making the, the, the judgment that yes, he was wrong, um, but, but we shouldn't impeach. But even most of those people understood fundamentally that this, this isn't to America, it's not who we are, and it's, it's, it's intolerable conduct from a president. Um, and I think part of the story of this period of time is what happened, how quickly we went from a real, almost unanimous understanding of what had happened to people being willing to embrace Donald Trump and, and bring him back into the fold. I mean, that censure resolution is a very powerful resolution that lays the blame squarely on Donald Trump for what happened and condemns it. One of the the primary reason it didn't come up for a vote is Democrats didn't want it to come up for a vote because they didn't want to give Republicans an out without voting for impeachment. Right, well, and uh, impeachment is the constitutional remedy. Right. You know, there really is no, there's nothing in the Constitution that says if he commits high crimes and misdemeanors, you know, you can censure him. Impeachment is what's provided for in the Constitution. Of and course, I, you could vote to censure and impeach. I mean, you could vote yes on both resolutions. You could, um, but uh, in my view, there was simply, you know, the, the censure resolution didn't have any basis in the Constitution. And, and I talk in the book about uh, discussions I had with Chip Roy from Texas, for example, who, it, you know, he, he texted this to me. He said he had read the censure resolution, but he kept coming back to the fact that Yes, Donald Trump did all these things, and those are impeachable offenses. Now, of course, and Chip gave a very important speech on the floor of the House, um, but he didn't vote ultimately to impeach. You write that in a just world, those are your words, in a just world, 
the January 6th committee's investigations and the criminal prosecutions that followed would be the end of, of Trump's era. And that, quote, Donald Trump and those who aided him would be scorned and punished. So that has not happened within the Republican Party, obviously. What, what is that? I mean, that's a, this is a difficult question, but what does that mean? You said in a just world, right. this would have happened. Are we not in a just world? Well, I think that what it means is that you know, the elected leadership of the Republican Party has demonstrated they can't be counted on to defend the Constitution. And, and you know, the fact that that's where we are is a, um, is a really stunning thing. Um, but, but I think it also goes to the, the obligations that we all have, which is um, not to look away from this, uh, not, to, um, not to think, well, it's just it's too uncomfortable, it's too difficult, um, it doesn't matter. You know, every single individual has a responsibility uh, to stand up and, and with your vote and with your voice uh, to make clear that this can never happen again and the person who did this can never be anywhere near the Oval Office again. You, you also write about going to Kevin McCarthy and urging him to you know, take a stand on Trump's behavior on, on January 6th and asking him to think about how past Republican leaders like Ronald Reagan, George Bush, your father, Dick Cheney, would have reacted to what we all witnessed on January 6th. And Kevin McCarthy tells you, this isn't their party anymore. Now that's a case where he's telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? no, I mean, it, um, it, this was after a, a press conference where, the, it was actually the last press conference that we ever did together, uh, where he and I were both asked whether we thought Donald Trump should speak at, the, at CPAC. He'd been invited to speak at CPAC, this was in February of 2021, and Kevin said yes he should, I was standing behind Kevin and the reporter said to me, asked me what I thought, and I said, I don't think he has any, any role to play in our political process going forward, which brought a very quick end to the press conference. And you went um, one direction, McCarthy yeah, went the other. I mean, the yeah. visuals are very... Uh... Yeah. Um, but it wasn't a surprise that that was my view, yeah. but, but it, you know, it was after that uh, when you know, Kevin was essentially saying to me, you know, why did you disagree with me at this press conference? And, and I was trying to convey, look, this, is, this, this matters. This is about the Constitution. And, um, and I, I think what he said was true, um, but it doesn't have to be true. And I, by that, I don't mean this needs to be a party that looks backward, but it does need to be a party that embraces the Constitution. And part of the lesson of this period of time was too many leaders sort of viewed themselves as bystanders or as sort of just kind of riding on the wave of, of opinion. And, you know, people would say things to me like, well, but the opinion polls show the majority of Republicans think the election was stolen. Well, they showed that because, you know, these same people were telling them that. Yeah. And, and so I, I think, you know, the obligation and the duty of elected officials um, to understand they have to actually influence events and, and not sort of hope someone else is gonna come along and, and do the hard work. I mean, there have also been polls, recent polls showing a, a significant minority of the country believes that January 6th was a quote, inside job, that the FBI was somehow uh, behind it. So I wanna ask you, and I wanna to get to, to questions shortly, but I, I, from the audience, but I wanna ask you about something that the person who replaced you in Republican leadership said just a few days ago, Elise Stefanik referred to the people that are in prison right now because they attacked the capital of the United States, many of them who've confessed to their crimes, most of them who have been convicted of their crimes, uh, as hostages. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's no bottom, right? I mean, um, <laughs> it's... Uh... Thank you. Uh, the idea that individuals like Elise would, would think that they can claim to be members of the party that respects law enforcement, of a party that respects the rule of law, and then call these people, many of whom brutally attacked police officers on that day, 
call them hostages. And, and again, you know, but the, this goes to the obligation that we all have because people do that because they think it's gonna help them politically. And there, there are millions of Americans, many of whom have been betrayed, have been lied to, who believe what Donald Trump has told them, um, others who are doing this for personal gain, but who are gonna work really hard to try to ensure that that, that message resonates and that they have electoral success. And, and that's why none of us can sort of sit back and, and, and accept that rhetoric or become numb to how disgraceful that really is. But you know Lisa Stefanik. You know Lisa Stefanik. Why, why yeah. do you think that she called them hostages? She doesn't I believe mean, that, does she? No. Um, look, many of us who have known Elise and who've worked with her over the years um, have spent a lot of time sitting around saying, like, what the hell happened here? Um, and, you know, I, I, I I don't know, except that it, you know, it's a lot of craven ambition. But it's so much craven ambition that you sort of start to think like, as I said, there's no bottom. Okay, so before I get to the questions here, are you running for president? Just quickly. <laughs> Not right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a student of, of these answers. Yes, that, didn't, sure. that did not sound like a definitive no. Um, but but like I, you obviously, it's a little late to run for the Republican nomination. Um, <laughs> there's an opening. There's now. an opening. Um, um, th th there is this no labels uh, movement, which a lot of Democrats see as something that's a real threat to Biden um, and a way to get Trump elected, um, but which the people behind it say is a, is a reflection of the fact that most of the country wants somebody besides Trump and Biden. What do you make of that effort? You know, I think that, um, I think it's important to, to be able to assess that effort, to assess the potential for an independent candidacy once we know who the nominees are. And- I think it's gonna be Trump and Biden, but- <laughs> I think it's, it's a like based chance. on your, your deep, yeah. I think there's a you deep, so? yeah, and this yeah. took a lot of like real. <laughs> Look, I mean, um, I think that's the most likely outcome, but, but we don't know that for sure yet. True. And, and I think there's a tendency before we know, and maybe after too, but there's a tendency sort of, you know, to, to say, oh my gosh, third parties never work, independent candidacies never work. Um, I'm gonna do whatever is necessary to beat Donald Trump and, uh, you know. Uh, and it, it, we'll see. So you think Nikki Haley has, I mean, nobody's voted yet. I mean, I would, in all seriousness, right, I would say right. that we've seen surprises. We've seen major surprises in Iowa and New Hampshire and in, in the Republican primaries. I mean, it would, it's not inconceivable that she could win. Oh, I mean, nobody's voted yet. Yeah. So, um, so we'll see. And, and I also, I mean, you mentioned some of the polling that we've seen recently about people's attitudes toward January 6th, for example. And what gives me hope in those polls is the vast majority of Americans um, understand what happened, don't want it to happen again, understand who was responsible. So while the numbers of people that, you know, say they believe the lie is disturbingly high, it's nowhere close to a majority uh, of Americans. And I, I fundamentally believe that for most American voters, deranged criminality is not a positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have some questions. Um, uh, I'll just start with the one at the top of the list. Uh, you are a mom. How was your decision to stand up against Trump and MAGA impacted your family? If given the choice, would you stand up again, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I mean, in in so many ways, um, my decisions throughout this period—I think always, but certainly throughout this period—have have been influenced by by being a mother. And um, you know, there was one one moment in particular where we were having uh, dinner, my husband and I, with our two youngest. Uh, our, our two sons, and, and I, this was right after January 6th, and I remember looking across the table at my sons and, and having this sudden realization that, you know, people that are in our generation 
you know, every American, frankly, until now, has grown up being able to, to take for granted the peaceful transfer of power. And um, my, the idea that my children, that our children would suddenly not be able to take that for granted um, was a very chilling thought. And, and I think wanting to ensure that our kids live in freedom um, is, is not just my obligation as a mom, but I think all of our obligation as Americans not not to let this slip away, and and the fragility of this moment, the fragility of our system, um, is a very real thing, and and it can very easily slip away. So what I'm hearing you say, both right then and also in your book, and uh, I've been hearing you say for a while, is you are going to be engaged in this election, whether or not it is running as a third party candidate or actively, what, campaigning for, for Biden? I mean, is that a possibility? I, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be engaged in this election cycle to make sure that people understand the danger, um, to make sure that independent voters don't you know, find themselves, and look, I, I say this as somebody that has a lot of objections to Joe Biden policies in a whole range of areas. What we have to make sure is that you don't have a situation where independent voters in particular who get frustrated with Biden policies think, well, I'm just going to you know, go with Donald Trump, that they somehow view him as the lesser of two evils, because he's not. And, and I think making sure people understand that danger. I'm also going to be engaged in races that are down ballot, in helping ensure we don't elect election deniers. Um, and, and again, I think it's important uh, that the Republicans not have the majority in the House of Representatives in 2025. <laughs> I mean, the other thing Elise Stefanik said the other day was that she wouldn't commit to certifying the certified results from the states in, in the next election. Right, right. Um, another question, the audience that needs to hear your message aren't coming to 92NY. <laughs> I don't know why you would say that. Um, how do you propose this message gets to middle America and to people who need to hear it? Yeah, look, I think um, it's a couple of things. First of all, I think it's understanding that no one, you're not going to be able to convince everybody, and, and you don't have to convince everybody. But um, recognizing that, you know, fundamentally, the majority of Americans know this is a good country. The majority of Americans know that we need leaders you can look up to. Um, that, you know, I don't, I don't view these as, as partisan issues. And, um, you know, one of the... I, one of the saddest interviews that I have done over the last month or so was on Fox News. And, you know, I was a contributor on Fox for many years. Um, and, uh, you know, you go there now and, and, you know, there's a sense of, among many people, um, people would sort of come up to me quietly and say, thank you for what you're doing, thank you for what you're saying. Um, but I, I think that Fox has played, along with a number of other media outlets, a, a, very, a very dangerous role in perpetuating the former president's lies. And people believe what they see on Fox. People believe what they hear the former president say. But, but, but those can't be the only voices out there. You know, I, I want to ask you something else that we could have a whole other conversation about, which is the January 6th committee, one thing that really comes out is the role of women mm. in women who worked for Trump, who had the courage to come out and to tell their stories while others weren't. You know, Casty Hutchinson, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Matthews, yep. uh, Alyssa Farah, uh, Stephanie Grisham, who was the at one point the press secretary. She resigned on January sixth. Yeah. Two of the cabinet members that resigned, Elaine Chao and Betsy DeVos, women. What, why do you think that is? Yeah, it's it's. Um it's, it's fascinating and I think it's really important. Um, and the, the, these women who, and, and they're young, I mean, they're, you know, Cassidy and Sarah are the age of my, my daughters. Um, and, and I saw this also among Hill staffers, you know, young people who worked in some cases for members that were very pro-Trump, but, but, you know, who recognized immediately that this, this uh, behavior is, is unsustainable, that this is wrong. And I think um, both with respect to women, but also 
all of the people that we saw stand up against Trump, uh, people like Rusty Bowers, um, people like Brad Raffensperger, um, people who did the right thing, people at Trump's Justice Department, uh, and there was tremendous pressure on them. And a lot of them have really paid a price. They've paid a huge price. You've and, paid a price. And I think, but I, I think that's where that the lesson of that is: individuals really matter, and they make a big difference. And you know, the kinds of people that were around Donald Trump in his first term, who prevented him from some of the worst that he wanted to do, will not be around him in the next term. Uh, if he were to be reelected again. And, and so when people, sometimes they say, well, you're catastrophizing the potential of another Trump term, um, but, but he's told us what he'll do. And you know, he said that he will have in office people like Mike Flynn, who you know, in December of 2020 suggested that Trump should use the military to seize voting machines and rerun elections in swing states. Um, we also know that if Trump is elected again, he'll refuse to enforce and abide by the rulings of the courts. And that is something people also really need to think about. The only, the only reason that we, we are a nation of laws, the only reason that our, the rulings of our courts have authority and, and power is because our chief executive enforces them. And so if you have a president, and, and this isn't based only on what Trump said previously, it, part of it is in the, ar the arguments that we heard yesterday. When you, you listen to Trump's lawyers talk about the power of the president, and um, if you have a president who will only enforce judicial orders if he agrees with them, then you're not living in a nation of laws. And, and that is one of the most dangerous things that, that we would face if we were to have a second Trump term. Well, he, the argument probably won't prevail, as you said, that he made yesterday, but he argued that a president is above the law, right. quite literally. That should tell us something about how he'll approach yeah. his time in office if he gets back. I mean, that's, that's the thing about this moment that we're in. We don't have to guess, and, and like, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, look at what Trump is saying. Look at what his lawyers are saying. Look at what the House Republicans are saying. I mean, every time any of these people gives an interview, you know, they, they tell us what they would do, and we need to believe them. Um, as I mean, one of the themes of, of my book is betrayal, uh, uh, I mean, is, is, is the way that he is going to try to get retribution against anybody who opposed him. I imagine you're pretty high on that list. Um, <laughs> uh, almost out of time, I've, I'm going to combine two, and you can answer very quickly because it's a very easy question. Please explain why the Republican Party leadership failed to articulate a message that was more compelling to Republican voters than Trump's. And the related question, how does the Republican Party rebuild itself? You have 30 seconds. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah, a few more. Thanks. Go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, with respect to the first, I think it, it was not about messaging. It was about um, you know, becoming willing hostages to Donald Trump. And, and it, it's, we've seen it in other places. These are authoritarian tactics he's using. I was very surprised that it would happen in the United States. I was surprised that members of Congress that I thought I knew well, that I'd worked with for a number of years, that, that so many of them turned out not to have the character that I thought they did. Um, but, but it also, you know, it, it tells you how dangerous the moment is because if you, you know, well, the Wall Street Journal, for example, recently suggested we don't have to worry about a second Trump term because the checks and balances of the Congress and the courts will protect us. I just explain why the courts yeah. won't do it. And if you think that a Congress made up of people like Mike Johnson and Ted Cruz and you know J.D. Vance and Josh Hawley and Elise Stefanik, they're not going to stop Donald Trump. So, so the notion that the institutions will protect themselves if the people you know, uh, don't is, is absolutely wrong. I think that, I think we're gonna have to either rebuild the Republican Party or have a new party that arises. Um, I think that's gonna have to happen after 2024. Um, for now, uh, we have to be focused like a laser beam on keeping Donald Trump out of the White House, on protecting the country from that threat. 
but, but you know, I'm a conservative, and, and I, I believe that the country has got to have two parties that are based on substance and policy so we can have the debates we need. And, and I, you know, every day that goes by that the Republican Party continues down the path it's on uh, makes it less and less likely that, that it can be sustained or that it should be sustained. But, but after 2024, we're going to have a, a huge rebuilding or building job to do. You've talked about, obviously, the dangers of the leading candidate for the presidential nomination. You also, just a short while ago, said that we have to work to ensure Republicans don't get control of the House again. Do you still, at this moment, do you consider yourself a Republican? Um, I'm not a Trump Republican. Obviously, um, well, that's fair. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a news break, <laughs> news flash. We've got our news. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, look, I'm... Uh, I believe fundamentally in the principles the party was built and, and based on, and uh, and I'm going to work to make sure that you know again whether it's this party or another one that that that, that kind of of party exists. Um, but but I, I I think you'd be hard pressed to defend well, not hard pressed you cannot defend uh, what the party of today what the leaders of the party of today. Uh, are doing and, and putting up with and, and enabling. All right, Liz Cheney, we are out of time. Thank you very Thank much you, for being here. Thank you to the 97 Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.